Okay, you ready? Yeah. Um, so, Lucy, it's an honor to meet you. Before we dive in deep, our readers would love to learn about your fascinating origin story. Can you please share with us a story of your childhood and how you grew up? Yes, I'll try to keep it, you know, somewhat short. I grew up in, I was born in Montecito, California, which is a small town in Santa Barbara by the beach. And I was born at home. My mom had a midwife and no drugs. So uh, she gave me a great beginning at life. And I really appreciate that. I grew up in the Malibu mountains area uh, through high school. And, and I had a very normal childhood thanks to my mom. Um, my, I have a family of musicians. I have musicians on both sides, grandmothers and, and my father's a musician. And um, so I grew up around a lot of music and just decided from the time I was five years old that I was gonna do what I loved. And that was singing and acting and, and one day write a book. I had that thought at five years old too. And uh, so I just grew up in the arts. I grew up doing what I love to do, which is performing and creating. And, and that's taken me many places. My mom wouldn't let me have a career until I was 18, actually 16. She said, you cannot get in an acting class until you're 16, but on that day, if you still want to, I will help you. And on my 16th birthday, handed her the phone in an acting class <laughs> and that's when I started pursuing a career as an entertainer um my dad is an entertainer but I didn't see him very much when I was young he he was off on the road and my parents were divorced so I had a stepfather I call him my gym dad because I've been fortunate enough to have two fathers in my life. And my mom kept me very far away from the world of fame. I didn't really know who my dad was until he got back with the Eagles when I was 12 years old. And then my life changed and our whole family's life changed because for the first time, I realized that my dad was somebody pretty pretty well known. And um, that was a very bizarre experience at 12 years old. Mm. So that was my early life. Um, in a nutshell. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Beautiful. So you mentioned that you started, it sounds like you started with, uh, with acting rather than the music. So yeah, you want to tell us how that started? You know, what, what the process was, how you got your first, your first gig? Yeah, I I remember being five years old and I was watching Gone with the Wind and I saw Vivian, Vivian Lee and I kind of pointed at the screen and I said, that's what I am. I want to do that. And I didn't really know what that was, except I was very drawn to it on a soul level. And I've heard of other actors having that experience. I just heard Mark Ruffalo talking about seeing Marlon Brando in a film when he was about the same age and he had the same kind of epiphany. Um, so that was it for me. I, I never questioned thing to, things after that. Acting has always been my, my, my purpose at the deepest level. And um, what I did do when I was 10 years old was I, my mom took me to see the Nutcracker Ballet and I saw Clara on that stage. She's the lead of the Nutcracker, if you know the story. And I was a 10 year old kid and I looked at her and I, again, kind of like pointed up and I said, I'm gonna be her. And I had my mom get me in ballet and I, and I danced my way through to, to age 17 when I got that role and I danced that part in the Nutcracker at the Civic Arts Plaza in Thousand Oaks. And that was a real dream of mine, but acting was incorporated there. It was an acting role, you know? So already, even though my mom wouldn't let me have a career, I was already trying to weasel my way in somehow. Um, the other acting experience I had as a child was my gym dad is a music manager and he was managing an eighties hair band at the time called Baton Rouge. 
and they have a song called walks like a woman and they put me in the video and I got to be the little girl. You can see it on YouTube. And I was so, I was so alive in front of that camera. And I went up to the director when my work was done and I kind of pulled on his pant leg. I was like seven years old. And I said, I'm ready for my next shot. I'm ready for my next scene. And they had to kind of like, you know, have my mom escort me off the set. And <laughs> I've just always been obsessed with getting to act. That's just never changed for me. It's amazing. Unbelievable. <laughs> So you want to tell us how you transitioned to uh, the music industry as well? Yeah. So like I said, I grew up in music. It was always very natural to me. I grew up singing three-part harmonies with the gospel music with my mom's mom, Wanda, my grandmother, who my book is about. And then on my dad's side, my grandmother Walsh was a trained sight reading pianist. She played for the New York City Ballets. So I had both sides of being a musician. I had the ear training and the theory and the, the sight reading. Um, I always kind of took it for granted, I think. I love music, but it's not what, what really lit my fire like acting ever did. That's a, I, I don't mean to sound like disrespectful or like I take it for granted because I don't, but um, it's all the same to me. It's all just a part of, of what makes my soul happy. And that is to be singing and acting and, and, and just on stage <laughs> uh, with an audience. So when I graduated high school, I, I knew that I wanted to pursue music and acting and I moved to Hollywood and I didn't know how to start because my dad always said, if you want to do this, I'm not going to pick up the phone for you. You're going to go out and, and find it. And I'm so grateful he did that because I did. And all I knew to do was to go to concerts at clubs and introduce myself to other musicians. And that's what I started to do. And through that, I became friends with, um, with great people and, and went on to, to tour with them. And I've toured all over the world playing in other people's bands. And then I got my own record deal. I was signed by Jay-Z to Island Def Jam. Um, I've toured all over the world. I've had songs on the radio. I've sung for presidents of the United States. I've performed at the biggest venues. I, you know, opened for Maroon 5. I've had a fabulous time with my music. And acting has always been a part of that. Uh, for instance, I did a film in 2016 called Mother's Day. It was directed by Gary Marshall. And he put one of my songs in the film in a Julia Roberts scene. And so, you know, it's always hand in hand. It's it's just what I bring to the table. <laughs> it's beautiful, amazing. So you probably have so many fascinating experiences and memories and, and stories. Looking back, and I'm sure this is yeah. very hard to <laughs> single out, can you share one or two of the most memorable or the most, or the most humorous stories that have occurred in the course of your career? You want to hear a good one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Okay. All right. So... Uh, the year was like 2007 or something. Uh, I don't know. I could be off on that. You, you can YouTube this as well. I was performing with Ashley Simpson and we were performing at the, the halftime show of the Orange Bowl in Florida, the football game, right? The big 70, I don't even know how many thousands and thousands of seats that place holds. The Orange Bowl halftime show. We were performing with Kelly Clarkson and Trace Atkins and we were last. And we'd been in rehearsals for days with pyrotechnics and th a thousand cheerleaders on the field with us, dancers, fireworks going off. It was a huge deal. And we get on the field to perform and there's no sound in our ears. We were playing to in-ears. The band was playing live uh, to a track. And then Ashley and I were lip syncing. Um, and there was nothing, wait, let me get that right. 
the band was playing to a track and Ashley and I were singing live. Got it. I was her backup singer. And so Kelly Clarkson goes out, performs. There's no sound. Everybody's looking at each other like, what do we do? What do we do? Sound men are running around. I swear to God, so many people got fired that day. All we had was static in our ears. And Kelly comes off the stage crying. Trace Atkins goes up. I don't he, he, It was a train wreck. And we get up there. And all we had was like a four second bounce back of the sound ricocheting off of this giant stadium. And all I could think to do was watch Ashley's mouth from like 20 feet away so that at least her and I could stay in time. But when you watch it on YouTube, we're like four seconds off from the band and it just sounds so bad. And we got done and the entire stadium was booing mm, mm. and I just put my hands on my hips. They had been booing since the beginning, since Kelly started, but because we were last, it looked like we were the ones getting booed. Mm. And so I just put my hands on my hips and I slowly turned around and I just said, take this in because you are never gonna experience something like this. This is so one of a kind experience and this is just crazy. <laughs> It was nuts. And uh, needless to say, uh, we got very drunk that night after the show. It was not a nice day. <laughs> uh, I'm really amazed at, at uh, your resilience and, you know, equanimity. You, do. you have to laugh, uh, right? Listen, like I mean, everything that can go wrong when you're performing will go wrong. Like I've been on stage in front of 5,000 people at Universal City Walk and my whole band was playing in a different key than my piano and we didn't know how to fix it. So we started the song over like five times. It was an absolute nightmare. I've had drunk people get up on stage with me. I mean, if it's going to go wrong, it will. And that is what being a seasoned performer means that you have performed live enough to work out anything that could go wrong so that no matter what happens, you can keep that audience comfortable. And if you're keeping the audience comfortable, you can get away with anything. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. No. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I would I mean, I you probably just want to run away and just yeah. crawl into a rock. What's amazing is that you the next day or the next week you continue performing. You know? Get right back up there, baby. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> amazing story. Um, so can you share with our readers any of the exciting projects that you're working on now? You, you mentioned the book, you have so many things going on. You know, share with us what we should get excited about. Yes, right now you should be very excited about my new book. It's called Remember Me as Human. I have fulfilled my life, my my lifelong dream of being a published author. And I am I'm just thrilled. This is so surreal. So when I was 17, my grandmother Wanda gave me 63 of the remaining love letters that my grandfather Dale had written to her during World War II from 1943 to 1945 when he was fighting in France. And when she gave them to me, I, I knew they were a big deal and I knew they were very important. And I knew that I wanted to turn them into a film someday, but I didn't know how to do that yet. So I dreamt of getting to Ron Howard and Tom Hanks and I would keep them in my purse. I would keep the letters in my purse so that if I ran into Ron Howard at the grocery store, I could pitch him my idea for the film. And here's one of the letters here. This is from January 9th, 1945. And um, yeah, there's 63 of them. They're very special. And I've included some in the book as well. So, I didn't know how to make the film yet, but I knew that I had to start asking questions to fill in the story around the letters. And so I did, I started asking questions, but before I could get the chance to really speak with my grandfather at length, he died with Alzheimer's. And that really freaked me out because his stories and his memories were gone forever. And I couldn't stand that. So that led me to interviewing my grandmother, Wanda, 
in her nursing home when she was 97 on camera for three days about her life and the letters. And she died four months later. So I'm so grateful that I did it. And this book, Remember Me as Human, is the story of those three final days that I spent with my grandmother, Wanda. And what started out as me asking her about the letters really became a master class in what it means to be truly human. And that's the book. Hmm. Wow, unbelievable. unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It's, 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 wow. it's an incredible, an incredible read. Such a great idea. It pretty much, you know, everyone has, everyone could do that with their grandparents. And, you know, like there are probably so many rich stories that are lost by, by us not doing that. I'm really glad you said that, Yitzi, because that is the takeaway that I want every reader to have. I want this to inspire you to ask more questions of your elders and of your loved ones, not even elders, but of each other while we still have each other. Because once we're gone, we're gone. And so much is lost. Mm. And I don't think we speak to each other enough. I don't think we're curious enough about each other. And I don't think we're curious enough about ourselves. But I do know that we all share one important thing, and that is this ache to understand who we are from who and where we've come from. And that's going to take some digging. So I really hope that this book is inspiring in that way. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so this is our signature question that we ask in all of our interviews. Um, so you've been blessed with so much success in your very uh, uh, textured and varied career. Um, I've been blessed with a good work ethic. That's what I've been blessed with. And that that's has led to the success. That's well said. Uh, Touche. Excellent, <laughs> excellent correction. <laughs> um, so can you share with our readers uh five things you need to create a successful career in entertainment. Wow. Oh my God. I could make so many jokes right now, but I won't. You could make jokes. We can include jokes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. My mind is going very strange places. Okay. <laughs> I want to really help people. This is supposed to be a helpful answer. Okay. Five things that you need to have success in the entertainment industry, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Um, wow. Woo! One would be a work ethic. All a work ethic means is showing up repeatedly and consistently to put the work in for the time that it takes to achieve your goal. And oh. thankfully, I was shown the example of a wonderful work ethic by growing up around my dad's band, the Eagles, because those guys get on stage and make it look easy. But I've seen behind the scenes, the countless hours that my father puts into one guitar lick to get oh. up there and make it look easy. So I never ever mistook oh making it look effortless with, you know, anything else. I, I always saw what went into it and I'm so grateful for that. So number one is that work ethic. Oh God. Number two, man, is some fucking luck. <laughs> I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to who quote unquote makes it and who doesn't. Some of the most incredibly talented people I know are unknowns. So luck, I mean, God, nobody wants to hear that, right? But no, it's it actually it's very heartening. It's very, it's very uh reassuring that that idea that people often feel that if they're not making it, it must be they're not talented enough. But you're saying exactly it's not that at all. Oh my God, it's not that at all. It's not that at all. And I guess that leads me to say that something you have to have is a loaf. You have to create a life that you love living, regardless of if the success is coming or not. I've learned that the hard way. I 
defined myself for a long time by if I was booking the job or not. Uh, there's a lot of self punishment that I've gone through, you know, thinking that I'm worthless if I didn't book it, that I'm useless, that I should just give up. Um, and also like if I didn't book a job or the success wasn't happening, there was like this undeserving thing. Like I don't deserve to rest because I don't deserve to do anything good for myself until I've won an Oscar. I don't deserve a good meal. I don't deserve a night off. I don't deserve to go to the beach. I don't deserve to get my nails done. I mean, this stuff runs deep for all of us and we got to watch it. Mm. So I would say the fourth thing, the fourth thing would be um, emotional and psychological discipline to not let yourself go there and to keep yourself in the light and to use your spiritual tools that you have designed for yourself, whether that's taking a day off or going to church or talking to your spirit guides or however you think of your connection to your source, you know, whether you're religious or spiritual or whatever, having a glass of water, going to yoga, like taking a walk in the sunshine, all these little tools I've learned to implement in my daily life as I'm pursuing my creative projects in the entertainment industry, I have had to get really good at listening to myself and going, I need a break now. I'm going to step away from this and I'm going to go outside or I'm going to call my mom or I'm going to cuddle with my cat or I'm going to watch an episode of Friends because I need to laugh. Whatever it is, for a long time, I was so set, I was so obsessed with, with becoming successful that, that, I, that I wouldn't listen to my body and my mind and my soul when it was too much. And I've worked myself into the ground by not listening to myself when I need a break. I was flat on my back over Christmas with with an anxiety attack for a week in bed. Mm. And, I, and I've been in the hospital with that a couple times before. And I was so offended when they told me it was an anxiety attack because the pain is so intense. And it was this red hot excruciating fire that was coming out from my chest, down my limbs. And the doctor has the nerve to tell me it's anxiety. I said, how dare you? I'm in real pain. And he said, do not underestimate the toll that anxiety and stress take on your body. Watch out. Huh. And I've come to learn that stress and anxiety really does shorten our life and we have to watch it. So at this point in my life, a career or success or booking a job is not worth my life. I'm sorry. No. Gary Marshall, legendary director, cast me in his final film, Mother's Day. He has a bench at the Little Brown Church on Coldwater Canyon. And on the bench, there's a plaque and it says, life is more important than show business. And I always used to sit there. I, he would take me there and we would sit and I'd say, I don't agree with you, Gary. I don't agree with you because I would die to be a famous actress. I would die to book a movie. And it took me until now, and he's passed now, and I go to that bench and I say to him, I get it now. Mm. I get it now. Mm. And in that way, I would say that leads me to like number five, what you need to have success in the business is like a healthy, they call it sexy indifference. Jason Bateman likes to call it sexy indifference. It's not that you're not striving for your goals and that you don't care about it, but you are loosely connected. You are working towards your goals, but you're not defining yourself by when they happen. And you are not desperate uh, to get anywhere. You know, you really come from that solid personal core where you know who you are, you know what your personal boundaries are. That that comes back to like the the um the discipline I was talking about. You could also say that as like in terms of boundaries for here's what I'm capable of, here's what I won't do. And once you really know who you are and you know what you're willing to do and not do, you can just enjoy the ride. Because 
you know it'll happen when it happens because nothing is a reflection of who you are or how good you are or any of that. You're just enjoying the process. And, and I've gotten to a place after years of struggling with wanting to be famous because there was a lot of daddy issues tied up in wanting to be famous because I saw my dad so famous. And I thought, huh, well, if he's always busy in the world of being famous, then that's the world I have to be in to get his love and attention. So mm -hmm. I need to become famous for my dad to love me. Mm -hmm. And that took me, I would say, until now mm -hmm. to really let go of. And I'm so happy to be in a new place in my life. And I think COVID had a lot to do with it. COVID transformed all our lives in big ways. And for me, it allowed me that break that I needed to really work on myself and, and, and get to know myself away from being defined by any success that I was after. So now I approach everything I'm doing with no desperation, just enjoyment. And I love the life I wake up to every day. That doesn't mean it's easy. Are you kidding? I'm human. We all have really, really hard things that we're overcoming silently. I'm no different from anyone else. And the book deals a lot with that. The book is a, is a personal memoir that really speaks to embracing our humanity and, and, and to celebrating who we are in this very moment instead of trying to cover ourselves with a filter or with some fake crap that we think we need to have to uh, be viable in society. I'm not into that. And I think the book will be very helpful to everyone who reads it to help them embrace their humanity as well, because that's what we all share. So beautiful. You're so articulate, Lucy. Beautiful. I can ramble, that's for sure. <laughs> no, it wasn't, a, a ramble is uh, an incoherent stream of consciousness. This was a co though. coherent, logical soliloquy. <laughs> um, I think I gave you five. Yeah, There's many more things you need, you know, but that's what comes to mind if I were to riff on it. Perfect. Perfect. So this is our final question. This is our aspirational question. And you're touching that a little bit. Maybe we can go in a different direction. Um, so okay. Lucy, because of the platform that you've built and your great work and all the great work that you're doing now, you're a person of enormous influence. Um, and people take your words very seriously. If you could spread an idea or inspire a movement that would bring the most amount of good to the most amount of people, what would that be? Um, I think that my, my hope of inspiring people, um, would be about Elon Musk takes a very long time to think about his answers. So, you know, I'm channeling Elon Musk right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no rush. Take your time. You know, you could think about it. I'd like to inspire people and start a movement if I, you know, if the world were run by me. I would really like to inspire people to wake up to their curiosity. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people where they don't ask me a single question about myself. I don't know what that is. I don't know what's caused that. Um, I don't experience it as much in other parts of the world. If I'm traveling abroad, people seem to be more interested in each other. But in America, I think there's this pandemic of loneliness because people are very isolated from each other without realizing it. I think that there's a lot of separatism going on. I think that social media and AI are robbing us of our humanity and I'm very afraid of where we're headed. And if I stand for anything, it is preserving the human connection in every way possible in our lives. It makes me emotional 
because once we lose that, we're dead, you know? Suicide is at an all time high. Depression is at an all time high because people are alone in plain sight because nobody's really talking. Mm -hmm. And we must, we must. And that starts with being curious about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a pandemic of social media where it's about running from yourself. It's about anti-aging. It's about, it's about saying the right thing. It's about walking on eggshells because everybody's so woke that we can't have real conversations anymore. And it's robbing us of our humanity. Of course it leads to depression because it's isolating. Thank God for the comics who have the courage to continue saying things that need to be said. And I hope to stand for the same thing. So the more we embrace our human connection within ourselves and within, within our relationships, you get curious about yourself, get curious about other people, get your head out of your own ass and put your feet in someone else's shoes and talk about things that are hard to talk about, like suicide, like depression, like grief, like alcoholism, like mental illness, and the good things too, of course. But my book deals with all of that. And I believe that that's where the healing lies, is in embracing our humanity within ourselves and with each other. And that's the message I'd like to inspire. So beautiful. So well put. Um, is there a final question? How can our readers continue to follow your work online? How can they purchase your book? How can they purchase your music? How can they support you in any way? Thank you. So you can follow me on all socials. I'm the Lucy Walsh. My Instagram page is popping. There's all kinds of updates there every day. That's where it's all happening. Um, the book is available for pre-sale on Amazon. Remember me as human on Amazon. Uh, and, you know, it publishes March 12th. So please get yourself a copy, buy multiple copies, give them away as gifts. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, book to give as a gift to anyone you love. And please help us spread the light that way. It's a very powerful story. You will fall in love with my grandmother, Wanda Mae Boyer. You will be swept up in these love letters. And it, it it's really got something for everyone. So follow me. Uh, there's also lucywalsh.com. It's going to be a great year. <laughs> I look forward to meeting everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to, to connect with your readers and, uh, Please feel free to reach out to me if people have letters in their family, because we all share this. We all have love letters from our relatives. We all have letters from the war. Uh, and I'm starting a podcast after the book comes out where I will be having people on guests every week to share letters and artifacts from their families as well, because we got to pass this stuff on. It's very important for that human connection. So beautiful, beautiful. So Can I mention one thing that I'm working with uh, an organization that I'd like to, to include? So I just partnered with an organization called the National Association of Long-Term Care Volunteers. It's a mouthful, but it is an association that helps bring volunteer um, companions into nursing homes to spend time with the elderly. It's a pandemic in our country and in the world that the elderly population is very ignored. And you can make such a difference in somebody's life simply by volunteering to show up at the nursing home in your community and spend time with somebody every week, whenever you can, doesn't have to be you know weekly, whenever you can to just sit and listen to them or read with them or play cards or play music, whatever. It's very, very easy to get involved. So please direct message me if you want more information. Um, it's so easy to get involved as a volunteer in your community. And it really, it really does prolong and enrich people's lives in the elderly community. We're all going to be there someday. So we should take a look at it and really think about it for a second. So beautiful, beautiful. 
Okay, I'm, I'm stopping the interview, but I want to say one thing. Um, 